something that was magical at at Apple that was just innate in the in the kind of design culture there that I've definitely carried forward. Um, and <laughs> I didn't necessarily appreciate it at the time, but as I've been able to work with more teams and more people, I've definitely seen that most people don't think about it this way. And, and it's that, you know, when you're, um, it's just the idea that, you know, when you're presenting work, when you're reviewing work, your job is... Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with Daniel Scrivener, CEO at Flow, investor at Blackletter, creative director at Made by Scrivener. Daniel was previously the head of design at Digit and Square. He's worked for some of the most respected brands in the world, including Apple, Nike, Disney, and Target. And get this, he doesn't have formal design education. He's a college dropout. That is amazing. And I'm excited to learn more about this. Daniel has advised world-class teams like Lending Home, Power, Trust Token, Designer Fund, and Notation Capital. He's an early stage investor in businesses like Superhuman, Mix Max, Notion, Good Egg, Burrow, Madison Reed, Stance, Almanac Brewing, and many more. He's a designer turned CEO, investor, and creative director, and I can't wait to dig into all these roles. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Daniel Scrivener. Thank you so much, Josh. It's great to be here. That's a big, big intro. <laughs> well, hey. <laughs> I'm I'm excited to unpack all of this. So you are calling in from Boulder, Colorado today, right? Yep, that is right. Yeah, we live up uh, just in the mountains. Um, but yeah, in Boulder, Colorado now. So this is uh, maybe to date us a little bit, but this is the third episode of Obsessed Show that I've recorded in quarantine. So um, I I feel like I need to ask you this question. How are things in Boulder and how are, how are you doing hanging in there? No, th things are, I think overall, um, I don't, yeah, I don't even know the word to use. <laughs> things, things are happening. I mean, people here are definitely, um, listening to all the guidelines. There's a lot of people now wearing masks and, um, you know, face coverings. Uh, it's super empty. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting time. I just feel like the more things go, the more this goes on every day, it gets a little bit more surreal kind of to the point of like, is this, are we really living through this? Are we going to wake up at some point? <laughs> well, I, I think we could spend most of our time just talking about what's different and what has changed. And, and I definitely want to jump in and talk more about flow here in a minute, but, but first off, you know, you're sort of sitting at this intersection of design and startups and investing. So I'm really curious, especially knowing that you dropped out of college to, to go pursue design what is your origin story? how did you get started in all of this? And how did you bring to it the investing piece and the design piece and, you know, working in technology? Yeah, no, it's a uh, happy to, happy to dive into that. Um, you know, it's really weird when I say or hear back, uh, all of those things because uh, it, they make they make a ton of sense to me, and I know and I understand how all those can kind of uh, coexist and work together. But it definitely, anytime I ever try to explain uh, what I do or what I'm interested in, I usually just get kind of kind of glances. <laughs> kind of glances. Uh, <laughs> but for me, you know, my uh, yeah, my background story, my origin story, um, is is definitely different than <laughs> than other designers that I've that I've met. So for me, growing up. You know, my least favorite class in middle school and high school was art. I did, didn't think mm. I was good at it. I didn't, uh, I wasn't interested in it. And, uh, you know, I would never consider myself sort of an artistic person. And I don't even, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't say that I had a good, you know, aesthetic growing up. But for me, how I got hooked on design was one summer, I ended up taking a, um, in HTML programming class, you know, at that point there was no JavaScript, there was no CSS. If you wanted to make a website, you would just do the whole thing in HTML. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I took that class not having a ton of expectations, just thinking it was generally interesting. And by the end of it, I was able to make a website and I was able to have this thing that I could go and share with other people. But I quickly realized that it looked hideous and I, <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't super <laughs> excited to show it to other people. Right. And so then that started me down this path of, you know, well, what is that? Well, how do I, why, why don't I like the look of this? Why don't I like the feel of this? Um, 
And that ultimately is what led me uh, to design. And really, once I got that, at least for me, and I think everyone's definition of design is a, is a little bit different. But for me, it's this amazing intersection of solving really hard problems. Some of those are technical problems. Some of those are uh, you know, real-world business problems. Um, some of them are just like narrative problems or how do, how do you stand out in a space? And then combining that with um, this artful twist that's always hard to try to explain or quantify what that is. But ultimately, for me, the stuff that really resonates is something that the problem have, has been solved and it's been solved beautifully. Um, Um, and so that's kind of, that's my connection. And, um, once I, once I, once I figured that out, once I got that, I I was obsessed and I'm still obsessed with design. (laughs) That's awesome. Well, maybe fast forwarding to where you are at flow today. How did, how did that role come to be? Yeah, that's a great question. So Flow is a, uh, it's a subsidiary. It's one of the companies owned by a company in Canada called Tiny. And Tiny is led by Andrew Wilkinson, who uh, initially started Metalab. Uh, I'm sure most people are familiar with Metalab. And uh, then he started his own journey, frankly, of going from a designer to someone who's, you know, always been interested in business and investing and kind of uh, understanding better and better over time how that all fit fit to get, you know, fit together. And so I've known Andrew for quite, you know, a long time. Uh, you know, I feel like there's these designers and people that I met, I don't know, and connected with back in the nineties now <laughs> or early two thousands, <laughs> either by visiting their blog, you know, initially or kind of stumbling across one of their sites. And, um, Andrew was one of those people. He was someone that I just looked up to that I was interested in. I was interested in what he was doing. And so, um, for me, I've always been interested, you know, in my, I've, spent my career, you know, to date previous to, to flow, literally working myself up, um, you know, the the rank, (laughs) the design, the design ranks of being the lowest person on the totem pole, all the way to someone, you know, who over time became lucky enough, fortunate enough to be able to lead smaller teams and bigger teams. And, uh, you know, so over time I've learned leadership, I've learned, you know, uh, scratch the surface at least of, you know, how do you hire great people? How do you build a great team? Um, what does a great design culture look like? You know, how do you have a process where you can create these magical things again and again and again? So it's not just a kind of one-off lucky spark that happens. Um, and so really it was, you know, a lot of ser- serendipity, which has played a, a big role in my life. But so I've known Andrew, uh, you know, for 10 plus years, and this was back in, I guess, 20, not 2018. Um, and I saw he tweeted out that he was going to be in Boulder. And if anyone was around and wanted to grab coffee, um, mm. to, to let him know. And so I just said, you know what, I'd, I'd love to, you know, I've had met him once before that. Um, I was super interested to meet him. So we met for coffee and, uh, you know, I went into that meeting with no expectations. And, uh, as Andrew is a master at doing, uh, you know, that conversation quickly turned on me, frankly. And it was, you know, well, what are you doing? What are you interested in? What's kind of, what are you interested in next? And, uh, out of that, just kind of, you know, um, out of that over time, like leaving that conversation, Mm -hmm. um, I think left me really thinking, but out of that over time, then we started talking about potentially coming in and and leading flow. And the, the reason that made sense to me was it was a extremely product driven company and it's, you know, the design leader in the task and productivity space. Uh, so I had this amazing design thing that I could understand and come and, and shape a little bit. Um, and then it had a really hard business problem, which is it had been in business for 10 years. It had had a lot of success over that time, but it needed a little bit of a, you know, a reinvention. Um, mm. And so that, that kind of combination of things again, and the fact that it was privately held and, and, you know, run by people that I had tremendous respect for, all of that gave me enough confidence it, maybe confidence is a little bit of a big word, but it gave me enough excitement that I was ready to, to jump in. Yeah. Well, I want to come into some of the details and kind of your philosophy there, but maybe just to set up a, a better idea of what kind of team we're talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of your, a lot of your team is, is based in Canada, right? So you guys are fairly distributed. Um, so going into all of this craziness, you guys, I would imagine we're, we're set up. <laughs> yeah, we were luckily set up really well for, for what has ended up, uh, transpiring, but it, yeah. So, you know, it, my background was up until I, um, up until I joined Digit, you know, that was my first time really making the move to working remotely and mm-hmm. understanding the pros and the cons and some of the trade-offs you make, um, when you, when you do that. And, uh, so I had that experience at digit, uh, for quite a while. 
And, uh, you know, Flow has been, it's been a remote-ish team for the 10 plus, you know, year history at this point um, that the company's been around, but it's been fully remote for, I think, the last two or three um, years. And so it's been really, you know, it's, I think it's very different to join a team. Uh, it's, yeah, it's very different to join a team and be one of the only remote people than it is to come in and lead a team where everybody's remote. And it's definitely, you know, there are a lot of pros that come with remote work. And I generally, I don't think remotes the trend. I think it's flexibility and freedom to be able to work and work in different Mm -hmm. contexts and work from different locations. And maybe you don't want to work 40 hours a week. Can you, someone hire you for 30 or 20, you know, to be able to get your skill set? I think that's where work is, is heading, but I think everyone's, you know, a little fixated on the remote piece. And, um, but, uh, you know, yeah, it has its pros and it has its cons, but I think overall it's been, it's been remarkable. Yeah. So my team's distributed throughout Canada. I'm in Boulder. We see each other, you know, once or twice a year, but other than that, it's all virtual. Mm. That's wild. Yeah. I hear a lot of talk about this, um, a recent term of fractional also where you, like you're talking about, you're sort of splitting your time maybe across a couple different companies. Is, is that a, a trend? Uh, I think it's definitely well? a trend. Yeah, I think it's definitely a trend. We haven't to date hired someone on some sort, you know, in a fractional role, but in my mind, it definitely makes sense. And it, if you take a, a few steps back, it seems absolutely ludicrous that the only, you know, it's either like zero hours or 40 plus hours <laughs> or right. you're all remote or you're tied to this one geographic location. And, you know, this is where your, your body has to be between nine and five, even if you have no meetings and no one to interact with. And, uh, you know, before that you can be home. And after that you can maybe, you can be home most of the time. Uh, it just seems absolutely insane. And so I think, you know, what we're in the really early innings of is, um, understanding how to work with people around the world in different time zones and different contexts and different countries with different cultures. And at the same time, starting to understand just how silly it is. And that if you are, you know, I, I get my point of view is at the end of the day, especially someone leading a business, you're the entire thing that you're trying to bias for is just incredible people. And I, if I find an incredible person and they want to work uh, with us for 20 hours a week, I'm just as excited about that as someone that wants to work for 40 hours a week. I think it's just taking a bit of time for everything else to catch up and to wrap our heads around, well, what does that mean for benefits? Well, what does that mean Mm -hmm. for retirement? What does that mean for all of these other things? Yeah. It's coming. So assuming you can figure all that other stuff out, then that, that totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, so you're not the first CEO that we've had on the show. Um, however, lots of, of firm owners or agency owners or CEOs are people who kind of like did their own thing and started their own thing and built up their own thing. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is a little different in that you went to go work for somebody and then became the head CEO guy. Um, do you think designers naturally make good leaders? So uh, that's a challenging, that's a challenging question. Um, I think there are things about designers, how they see the world, the, the approach they take to solving problems. I think, you know, all the best designers I work with are really masters at, um, you know, and this comes with cons as well too, but being able to see things in a much broader scope and they don't just think linearly, they're able to think about things really multidimensionally and, you know, uh, holistically. And I think those are amazing skills that I would say, uh, if you're a designer, you're going to be much higher on that scale, you know, than yeah, someone right. who maybe comes from a business background or an operations role. I think what's really challenging is you, you know, ultimately I think what makes someone a really great leader of a company is you've got this, this balance where, you know, you know, ultimately to be a successful company, you need to operate it incredibly well. So you need to understand things like finance. You need to understand things like, um, you know, equity and, and financing and, um, even just really simple things like how to look at a financial statement, how to think about a balance sheet, like, you know, how do you, especially for a business like ours, who, you know, I think, and that was one of the other big shifts for me was my whole career up until I came to flow was working for VC backed companies. And I think, you know, a lot of designers are very familiar with that and what that looks like and what that feels like. Uh, It is a world of difference to be in a business that is, you know, bootstrapped and you really have to, um, not only do you need to survive within your cash flow, but you need to find a way to thrive. So you need to find a way to, you know, have enough that you can reinvest in the business, that you can do things that move the needle in a big way. 
And I think that's been some of the biggest challenges. So, um, you know, I think designers come with a lot of amazing skills that make them great at vision. I think it's just about balancing out the execution and the finance operations side of that. Yeah. And I, I think, um, maybe for the, the extreme 40,000 foot, um, designer type who see things differently and they want to blow things up and don't really want to do the day to day, you know, maybe that's where the designer as leader needs that very operational, operationally minded number two person to, yeah. to be alongside them there. And I think, uh, yeah. And I don't think it's, it's not just an operations too. I think that's been something that, um, I mean, that was a big progression I went through in my own design career. I remember early on in my career, I really idolized people who were able to, you know, who were seemingly, seemingly, quote unquote, you know, can expand on that, <laughs> able to do everything. They could do identity design. They could do graphic design. They could do web design. They could do, mm-hmm. you know, iconography. Um, and I was just enamored by people like that because I just didn't, I couldn't wrap my head around how you could be good at all of those things. And then as I, you know, kind of pr- progressed in my career, I saw that, you know, no, that wasn't what I wanted to be. I, I really, over time, started getting drawn to, I, I thought about it as like a film director. Like my job is to have a vision for what we're creating, to hire, to kind of build the best team of specialists in, in some case, sometimes, you know, generalists as well too. And then to figure out how we get from where we are to where we want to go. And I find that challenge way, way, way more interesting than trying to be kind of a team of one. And I think for me, that's translated really well to being a leader because um, if you go into the role thinking that oh, I'm going to be great, at, I'm going to be good at finance, I'm good at sales, I'm good at hiring, I'm gonna be good at operations, mm-hmm. and oh, I'm also going to be good at kind of vision design, you're inevitably going to fail at all of that. And the reason you're going to fail is just pure time constraints. And, the, and I think I've had... Uh, part of this shift for me has been a massive appreciation of the number of things that need to be going well in parallel for a company to be successful. And I think mm. that, you know, you really, it's easy to underestimate from the outside looking in, but uh, when, you, when you're in it and you're charged with, you know, making sure that all these things are, are running well and being thought about super thoughtfully, um, yeah, I quickly realize you definitely can't do it alone. Yeah. I joke a lot. You know, I spent most of my career running and, and operating, uh, and leading a design and branding agency. And it was, it would be so funny to me to, you know, years into it, identify an area and a weakness that I didn't know I had a blind spot. I didn't even know was there to look back and think, how are we in business this whole time without (laughs) understanding? Like the first thing was contracts. Like how did I not ever have contracts three or four years into the business? And yeah, you know, you, you keep unearthing these things. And each time I was like, I didn't even, I didn't know what I didn't know. And it's, it's, uh, um, yeah, there, there's always things to, to learn and to, to get better at and to discover. Yeah, no. And you, yeah. And you know, that's some of that three dimensionality, you know, as, as I like to, I guess, think about it in my own mind of just all the facets of the thing that you need to, you don't need to, um, be able to do them yourself, but you need to have a general understanding of them. And I think that's part of the difficult part too, of just being in a, um, yeah, when you're leading a team, leading a business is uh, not only do you need to have a, a general understanding of things, but you need to have a little bit of nuance, but then you also need to be able to understand to hire someone better than you and kind of equip them to do it right. And uh, yeah, but there's, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to do. Yeah, <laughs> to do definitely. Well. So flow generally operates in the project management software space, right? Yep. I was hoping I wasn't completely stepping in it with that no, <laughs> description. No, you're not completely, you know, you're not stepping in it at all. And I think that's a little bit of a simplistic, uh, I don't know. That's like the blanket term people use to talk about the space. I think it's kind of funny because just it's, you know, you can't really manage projects without tasks and you kind of want to see stuff on a, on a timeline or a calendar. So the way that we've thought about it over time is um, that, you know, we just want to be, we want to be an amazing all-in-one tool that provides a lot of value for a little bit of time and investment in the product um, and can help you with, you know, kind of if you think about, uh, you know, productivity or you think about performance of a team or a business, you know, it's got a lot of layers. You need to have a vision for where you're going. You need to understand how that works out on a timeline. You need to have little buckets of work, uh, you know, that people often call projects. You need to make sure tasks are going well. Um, And so it's, you know, a lot more nuanced than that. And I've definitely had a, a big appreciation over time for how, how hard it is to build something like that. But uh, yeah. 
Yeah. I love this line that I, that I read, um, something that you had said about the best tech tools get more powerful, the less you use them, (laughs) which made my brain melt out of my ears a little bit, but unpack for us what that means. How do they actually get better as you use them less? Well, it's not that the tool get, you know, it's that uh, if you're thinking about it from like a machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, point of view, there's nothing about the tool that's getting smarter the less you use it. Yeah, but in right. my mind, I think, you know, what I aspire to have in my own life, what I aspire to, to, you know, the tools I aspire to work in, and I think this is generally true, you know, with our just generationally and where things are headed is I think that we've had this massive explosion and we're still in the midst of this massive explosion. And, you know, I don't think it's going to end anytime soon. In fact, it seems like it's going to get bigger and bigger (laughs) of, you know, the number of things you can listen to, the number of apps you can have on the phone, the number of services you can watch, the number of, you know, things that can help you manage the most microscopic people. Like now, if you wanted to, you could have, you know, a Pomodoro timer app and an email app and a note app and a to-do app and a document app. And when you think about that, it just, it's, uh, I think it gets really, gets really silly. And I'm not saying mm-hmm. that, you know, that you need to go in the opposite direction and try to just have a tool that does everything. Cause I don't think that works well either, but I think yeah. generally what people want is a few number of tools that are made with remarkable quality so that when they use them, they are not constantly frustrated. They don't want to rip their hair out. <laughs> they enjoy <laughs> being in the tool. You know, it doesn't use any, uh, manipulative, tactics that I think a lot of tools use today where they try to, you know, get you, ask you to sign up for useful notifications. Then all of a sudden you're getting upgrade requests and then some, you know, like letting you know about new features. I don't, I, those are in my mind are all things that can work in the short term, but will absolutely bite you in the ass in the long term. And I think that people don't think about that in a pro and con sense enough. And so really what that statement is, is just, you know, the, the bar, the bar that I have, the bar that we have at Flow for creating a great tool is one, we want it to be incredible for the lowest person on the totem pole that's using that tool. So I think most of these tools are meant for the CEO or more often they're meant for the project manager or the operations lead. And so they have a bunch of things that are great for those people, but they, <laughs> and that's who they're selling to. But then what ends up happening is no one that actually has to use the tool in, like, likes it at all. Like if right. people, people hate it. They don't want to, they don't want to be in it. And so, you know, we don't want to be there. We want to make it a tool that's amazing to use, uh, you know, whether you chose to use the tool or not. And then the other thing is we want it to be something that is, uh, sometimes I've thought about it as like just in time or, you know, just enough, but mm-hmm. it's having powerful features, but done in a really lightweight, flexible way where the idea is, um, the app is lightweight. You're not constantly bogged down with things and input fields and buttons and values and stuff that you have to do. And so really it's just this notion that we want to provide a ton of value and we want people to spend as little time in the tool as possible because I think we realize, contrary to a lot of other tools, that productivity doesn't happen in the productivity tool. Productivity happens right. when you're actually doing the work and the tool is there to help you understand where are you going what do you need to get done today to be able to stay on track? Great. Put it away. Now get to work. <laughs> yeah. The, the what's next question. What's the most important thing for me to do next? Yes. Um, and, and for most people who've used time tracking or project management or accounting software, what like n- nobody looks at those things and thinks, man, I can't wait to get in there and, no, you know, it's always like, uh, maybe I'll look at that later. <laughs> yeah. It's like, a, you know, in, in a lot of ways, I think that's it is it is, uh, you, if you want to be, I think, uh, you know, super productive, if you want to be prolific, if you want to generally just do a lot of things, whether that means, you know, and for designers, that can mean something like, oh, I'm doing an exploration on the screen. I would love, you know, two hours to be able to do like 10 different versions of it, you know, and that could be your your version of kind of iterating on that. But if you want to do a lot of things or you want to be prolific or you want to try different things, you're ultimately going to have to grapple with you have got a limited amount of time and a lot of things that you could put your effort and energy into. And I think that is where productivity tools are super valuable, but in a lot of ways, they're a necessary evil that just helps us keep us on track, help, help us from getting distracted, help us, uh, you know, from forgetting things or, or, you know, Oh, that was due on Friday, but I didn't think about it till Thursday. And I should have started working on, on Monday. Like (laughs) how do you get that kind of line of sight? So you know where you're going. So on the investor side, are you looking for things that are similar to what you're kind of building and preaching at flow or 
you know, it, is your, are your investments wildly different from where you live on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, they're wildly different. And, you know, it helps, I guess, to understand a little bit of the background story on that. So for me, you know, I've always been just growing up, I was just always interested in business and investing. And uh, on the investing side, I just, I got really attracted to people like, you know, I think Warren Buffett's easy to, to kind of gravitate towards. Yeah. And once you know the space more, there's a lot of really incredible investors. But what was remarkable to me about the people in that space was the clarity of thought, um, the way that they approached making really hard decisions with a lot of unknowable things in them. And so, you know, over time, I've just come back to it again and again and again as one, a way to learn uh, more about world class decision making, how you make great decisions, how you decide and weigh things when there's a lot of input and information. Um, and, but really, how I got into investing in you know, early stage companies was. I was fortunate enough to join Flow or join Square, excuse me, when uh, it was a really small team and stay there long enough that, um, you know, it was in a lot of ways an incredible experience, but I left that with, you know, a different level of resources uh, than I had ever had had in my life. And, Mm. um, you know, one of the things that was interesting there is I loved, I, I loved my experience of going all in on a company like Square for you know, five plus years. But leaving that, I was, I was dead set that I didn't want to do that again. And I wanted to you know, be a little bit, I wanted to have, um, one, I thought there was valuable experiences there. And at that point, I had met a lot of really incredible founders and teams that would just struggle with how to tie it all together into something that would create like a magical experience or a magical product. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I see these people with great ideas, great teams, and I can help them and get involved with them. Uh, And then on the other side, I saw it as a, you know, a really great learning opportunity of if I can invest in, you know, early on it, in my mind, I was like, oh, let's just do one. Okay, let's do two. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, now let's, you know, now I have a five or 10. And now I'm, you know, much, much higher than that. But one of the most amazing things about it is, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Is it's kind of like the way I've thought about it in my head is it's kind of like a scientist with 10, 20 experiments going at a time where you're able Mm. to learn from them, look across them, see what, you know, see what they're doing um, well, what's working. And so that was the initial idea. And then over time, it's just become something that I, um, I really love and I've, I've really enjoyed. And then what about, um, made by Scribner's your other Avenue vehicle company? <laughs> I'm not even sure the proper way to talk about this. What does your work look like in that vein? Yeah. So that's, uh, at this point, uh, that's mostly advising work. So I still do a handful of, uh, I still work with a handful of companies on an advising basis. And really what that is, is, um, historically it's always been around design. So it's been a company that I think has something remarkable. So, you know, maybe a good example of this would be lending home. Um, Mm -hmm. I had, so after I left square, I had, um, a really good friend, John Intrader, uh, who worked at Lending Home, and they had, you know, the story there, which is fascinating in and of itself, and designers will relate to this. Uh, but the story there is they had hired a um, branding and design firm. Um, I think had just totally approached the project the wrong way on all, on all levels, and you know, at the company's mm-hmm. level for sure. Um, but they left that with nothing they were excited about and a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> spent down the drain. So oh, no. they were looking to try to solve that. And so I, I, you know, John, um, I got in touch with John. We ended up um, talking. I ended up going and and uh, and meeting the CEO. And you know, I wasn't sure I, there was something interesting there. I, you know, I wasn't. I didn't go into that meeting with any expectations. But uh, when I was leaving the meeting, I kind of I just threw out the idea of you know, if you did want to do this again, I would I would love um, I would love to you know build a team, lead a team, and do it very differently. And it would be a very mm-hmm. small team. It would be done uh, with a ton of time spent upfront in exploration, not just trying to think of you're just doing it over the course of one or two months or whatever ridiculous yeah. timetable you try to put on people. Um, and so that's an example <laughs> of you know being able to go in and help a company with like a lot of great ideas and potential, just help them sort through how to work through it. Yeah. So how do you, how do you find that right size team? You know, when it's a smaller team, it's more focused, you know, depending on the client, I'm sure you're advising differently, right? How, how do you determine what's the right fit for that client? It's a great, it's a great question. Um, 
Yeah, I think it just really, I mean, a lot of it, to be honest, I think, um, and this is another thing that would be different than, uh, you know, about designer CEOs, but I think for a lot of CEOs, a lot of leaders, they have a really good sense. They they have a really good sense for what they want to express. So like, here's, here's what's happening. Here's the context. Here's where we're headed. And here's why I don't like this. Or here's why mm-hmm. I think we need to go somewhere else. They're amazing sure. at that. But they don't have... Really, it's like you know pulling blood from a stone to try, <laughs> try to get ideas about, okay, well, where do you take that? Or what are you drawn towards? And so you know, I feel like it always starts with really deeply trying to understand from the person or the people or the team that are in it all day long that know it in and out a lot better than you will you know what the story is what the context is what the narrative and and what and really what they're trying to do because i think at the end of the day when someone is especially taking you know undertaking something like a rebranding project it's because they are in their mind they they have evolved but their external appearance hasn't so they want to try to you know portray that or kind of upgrade that to the world and so, you know, once you understand that, then I think it really is coming up with your own point of view about where to take it. And that should yeah. definitely be something that, you know, you're throwing out ideas and there's multiple, you know, there's multiple directions. You do all the things that you kind of learn over time. Um, but I think really a lot of it is you coming up with the direction. Are you trying to connect the dots? Are you trying to, yeah, you're really trying to kind of like a detective, take these five, six clues and figure out where this thing should lead. And then, you know, I think the biggest thing that I usually have done differently um, is just in general, if I can work with one, you know, yeah, in general on a team, if I can say hire, I don't know, one or two generalists or four or five specialists that can do individual pieces of the project at an amazing level, I'm Mm -hmm. much more drawn towards hiring specialists for it. And I think for me, that's... um, I, yeah, I don't know. I just, I love that. Again, it goes back to that director idea of, you know, at the end of every movie, it's not like you look up and you see five names. You look up and you see, you know, 500 names and everything has a different role. And it, sure, there's some things about that that don't make sense and aren't, aren't great. But I think in design, one of the things that's incredible is that there are ridiculously off the chart specialists. And if you can cobble together a few of those and get them all on the same page and get a cohesive vision, you can unlock something that's really different and new. You said something a few minutes ago that I, that is just kind of bouncing around in my head about square, how that experience was incredible. But after you left, you knew you didn't want to do that again. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious what that was. And yeah. if, if that is something that you see in these other companies that you're advising, so it's something you're kind of helping them work around, or if that is like the red flag of what not to do and who not to work with, you know, of course they're, they're doing awesome and doing great things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but maybe unpack that a little bit for us. Yeah, no. So I didn't mean that in a, in a, in a negative sense generally, and I'll definitely give it more color, but I know a lot of people still at square. I think it's an incredible company. You know, I'm invested in it personally. Um, I think it'll continue to do well, but, um, for, so for me, that context is, you know, I was really young and, and early on in my career when I joined Square. And I still mm-hmm. remember, you know, the role I had before I went to join Square was at Apple. And I ended up staying at Apple for three and a half years. And that for me still is my, you know, I don't have a formal education in design. Apple was my boot camp. And I think mm, if I didn't yeah. have that experience early on in my career, I don't think any of the things I've done since would have you know, fall, kind of fallen into place or I would have known what to, what to do with them. So I had that experience at Apple and, you know, I got to a point uh, a little bit when I was there a little bit more than three years where I just had this realization of, wow, I'm incredibly lucky to, to work at, you know, a company that I thought I might work at when I'm in my, you know, forties and fifties. And here mm-hmm. I am in my early twenties working at, working at Apple, but one, and it's still the, uh, the most talented people I've ever worked with are at Apple. It's an incredible group of people. Like I can't say enough things for just the magic they've been able to create there. But once you learn how to execute and, and you know, design in the Apple aesthetic, you've kind of figured it out. It's kind of mm-hmm. like, say you're a magician, you've been practicing a, trip, a trick for multiple years and you can pull it off. You're not going to probably keep doing that trick again and again and again. And so for me, I just had this moment and I've always been, why? I, I, this is just... It's helped me, but I think it's somewhat of a defect <laughs> in the way my brain works. But for me, whenever I have that moment of comfort, I get really uncomfortable. And so mm-hmm. I just remember at Apple, um, just having this moment where I kind of projected forward in time. 
I'd been there for 10 years. I was just like, I don't know. Nah, I don't know. Uh, I don't think I want to. I don't think I want to be doing that. I think there's other yeah. things. And what I was drawn to is designers who, I uh, you know, I'd hopped around. And what I learned from designers that had done that is really what they were doing is if you you know learning how to design well in one aesthetic is fine. Learning how to design well in five different aesthetics for five different companies, you learn some really remarkable things about how to approach design from doing that. So I went, you know, I, I went to Square and. Um, yeah, I decided to join Square, super small team at the time. I think it was about 50 people. And uh, I just threw myself in. And for me, it was definitely an obsession. I loved being there. I, you know, I loved the opportunity, like I loved what we were doing. I loved who we were making stuff for. You're in San Francisco and a lot of our customers were merchants that I would go to every single day. And it was just really fulfilling. But I think for me, what that ended up creating uh, which is another way that I'm wired is just this potentially toxic feedback loop of something that's really an exciting and alluring. So I pour myself into it and, you know, then it just goes and goes. And, um, there were, you know, like, I don't regret working really late nights. I don't regret working on the weekend, but I went all in and I, you know, mm. d- uh, w- went all in there and, and really enjoyed it. But so that for me is, is when I left, I thought I don't want to join an early stage mostly dysfunctional <laughs> company trying to figure it out. And that's, yeah, you know, right. and, and I think when I was leaving Square, I somewhere in my mind was like, no, like all early stage or most early stage companies have it figured out. You know, Flow is just, a, or sorry, Square was just a little bit different. Um, that's not true at all. All early stage companies are in a perpetual process of trying to figure it out. And it's yeah. super messy. And um, I think that for me, I just want to space that out if I do it. If I do, <laughs> right. if I do it. Awesome. Um, do you have any design heroes, or maybe even heroes that you look up to? Other CEOs. I know you mentioned Warren Buffett, but who who are some of the people that you feel like you've modeled your career after? That's a great, a great question. I mean, there's like a you know seemingly endless. A list of uh, designers and, and people that, um, yeah, I've drawn inspiration from. I've, um, you know, looked to for ideas. Um, Lance Wyman is uh, one of my one of my favorites. I just love his work, and I find it. You know, I was just thinking about this actually the other day that at home, I've got uh, my wife uh, definitely jokes that I've got way too many books, and I I, I, I have a lot of books. But uh, for you know, for me, it like a lot of them are what I consider or what I call my reference library. And really, really what that is, is it's mostly, you know, uh, design books or design studies or, or books done about designers or design work. But it, it's, it's very old. And I remember, you know, something that I vividly remember is being early on in my career. And I would always be drawn to the like, best 500 business cards of 2020, you know, yeah. book. And it was always just the, the latest, the hottest stuff. And I found that over time, I, I'm not even, I'm not drawn to that at all. You know, I'm like, well, I'm yeah, always right. paying attention. I'm always observing, but I'm much more inspired by, like, I've got a book that I love called Book Assembles. And it literally is a book, um, I think it's made by Toshin, that is, I don't even know, three, four inches thick. And the whole thing, it basically is just a, um, I don't know. It's like Wikipedia meets the dictionary all about symbols. So it's all about mm. like, what's the history behind a flame symbol or what's the history behind using an owl symbol or what's the, and like stuff like that, I can just look at endlessly. And, um, and you know, and then the other thing I guess I would just quickly say is, um, I also, I find that I am, I'm a much better designer and I, uh, feel like I have a much broader base of inspiration to draw from when I don't just look at like other designers work for inspiration. So a lot yeah, of what definitely. I've drawn to, you know, is, um, other design firms. Like I was just looking at one over the weekend, probably going to butcher the name of the company, but it's Panini Farina, uh, who's done a lot of design work for Ferrari, for instance. And, you know, they no longer like Ferrari brought that in house and they now have their own design team, but that's, you know, just, uh, they have an incredible body of work. You know, another one that works in interior design that I've just loved their aesthetic is a company called Piet Boone. And just, you know, the textures they use, the colors they use, the materials that they use, I find, I just find a ton of inspiration there. Um, And I love, you know, being able to draw from like photography and film and cinematography and architecture. And um, yeah, so I don't, there's definitely not been one or two people. I think it's just this, I think, you know, in my, my perspective is, 
then I think most of us really create this constellation in our minds of things that we're inspired by. And it's not just, you know, maybe there are things that have a particular emphasis, but it's like you're developing your own wayfinding system for how to get around the world. And you've got this yeah. constellation of ideas. Yeah. I think system is a great way to, to view that, um, to think of it as here are all the things that, that influence me as a, as a creator or maker or leader for that matter. Yeah. And to be okay that it, some of those are super niche or super particular to you or aren't popular for other people. And I think that's something too, that I've just gotten a lot more comfortable in over time is, you know, I think for me early on in my career, it was just a lot of, um, I think a lack of confidence. I think just, um, I just not, you know, I think there's a, a hesitance. You want to like, you want to be you want to be looked to, but you don't want to stand out too much. You don't want to be too different. And I think over time I've just gotten, you know, uh, more and more comfortable and to be honest, more and more excited of like, I don't want to do the thing that's in the vein of all the other things. I want to try to add a new note. And that inherently requires that you do some pretty different stuff. Sometimes you just don't mind being the weirdo. Yeah. I think that's a great quality. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Hey, given all of the different angles that you might come at this from, including that we're in quarantine at the moment. Um, this answer can be anything, but this is a question I've asked everybody on the show. So I'm, I'm curious what you find that you are most obsessed with right now. Yeah, it's definitely quarantine specific. Um, I think for (laughs) me, it's, you know, being outside. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be hippie, which is maybe, um, you know, fits right into Boulder, but it's being outside and getting sunlight. Um, cause I think that a lot of people are maybe, taking the, uh, you know, the just stay within the boxed walls of your home approach to quarantine. It's nice to get outside and then realize that, uh, well, and here in Colorado, it's finally sunny and warm and it's not snowing for a little while. And that's this magical time of year. Um, but the stuff that I have been drawn to lately is, um, yeah. And I've kind of had this obsession over the last few years, but, um, I'm back really drawn to meditation, um, but I'm taking a really different approach. So now, you know, I've, I will bounce around between there's a, you know, there's an app I found recently called Indel, which is similar to another app called brain FM, which is make like ambient audio tracks. And I've found that really great to, to, um, for, for me to, to like get in the zone and do great design work, I feel like I either have to find the track that I can put on loop and just kind of like have that be repeating. Um, and it's usually something that's a little bit more energetic, but maybe doesn't have too much vocals. Or I've got to be on the other end of the spectrum where it's all ambient. And um, both Brain FM, and, Brain FM and Indel do a really great job of that. And so, you know, I, I found that I'm trying to meditate more without... Uh, in a non-guided way. So that's been really helpful just to have something there. Um, so it's yeah. not pure silence. Um, but then I've also been bouncing around between, yeah, 10% Happier, Sam Harris's, I think it's called Waking Up, um, Headspace. Um, and then another thing that I uh, have been getting into, which is a little uh, weird to get into, um, and it's all just trying my way of staying sane <laughs> with all mm, the stress nice. and, and changes is... Um, there's a company, uh, there's, there's a few companies that make these, but there's a company, I believe in um, Columbia, Missouri, that makes these red light lamps. Uh, mm. I, I think it's called mm-hmm. Sauna Space. And um, I've been really enjoying like incorporating that into my um, root, routine. And it's a great, I don't know, there's something really wonderful and nice about it. But being indoors and you know being able to put that on early in the morning and work next to it or meditate with it on. I've just really enjoyed. Uh, so I'm kind of a light fanatic in that way where I'm always attracted to like the light dim lights and different qualities of light. Mm-hmm. That, what is it about red light? What's the, what's the benefit of that? I mean, it does. So it's, uh, yeah. So there's, it's uh, the kind of two things are red light or near infrared light. Uh, red light generally is, um, uh, I don't know. It's, it, it's supposed to help detoxify your body. It's supposed to be something that you can, um, put on, like my understanding is a lot of models use it. It's something Mm. that you can put on kind of ambiently and it just helps it. It, uh, what it stimulates in your skin is like the production of collagen and it helps detoxify it. And it actually goes at a cellular level because it's a lot, uh, it's not just hitting the surface of your skin and then near infrared does similar, but slightly different things. And so there's a bunch of companies that make these. I just ordered another one recently called it's Jove, J O V V or J O O V V. Um, that does something similar, but a little bit, uh, a little bit different, but, um, yeah, it's been, it's been nice. 
Well, I was going to say that your skin looked amazing. So that's, <laughs> that's I, it's all the red light. It's all the red light. <laughs> <laughs> all of our listeners don't have the benefit yeah. of seeing this, but you, listeners just, just take our word for it. Um, you know, this is, you've got like the, the Benjamin button career going on where you worked with Apple is like your first thing out of the gate. You've had like these amazing opportunities to, to, to really step up and like designer turn CEO. But I'm curious if you have any dream clients or dream projects or, you know, dream companies that you'd like to work with or work for in the future. Man. Yeah. That's a, it's a great one. Long, 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 long <laughs> silence. Um, Traumatic pause. I know. That's a that's a great one. I think it's a great. Yeah, it's a weird question. I definitely don't have like I don't have a bucket list, and I think that's just it's not the way I'm I'm wired. But I think for me, it's just the I'm either really into what I'm doing at the moment, or there's or there's something going on that I haven't quite resolved yet, and I've got to try to figure that out. And that usually leads me to the next thing, but you know, there's like, I've just been super fortunate so far. And I think really my only aim is to try to continue working with people who are in their own way, way better than I am at <laughs> different aspects of design or different aspects of business and to be able to to learn from them. And I think for me in that way, it's much more like the challenge. It's much more about the challenges I take on and the people I get to work with and learn from than it is, you know, a, a certain logo or a certain uh, company. I mean, I, I would say that, I like, I'm not moving back to California, but I loved my time at, at Apple. And, um, you know, if there was some way to get a little inkling of that again, at some point in time, I think that's fine. But, um, and, and that would certainly be nice. But I think other than that, it's just to try to continue to like use design in new ways so that it continues to be interesting and challenging for me. And, you know, my, my career is, um, at this point, I've done a you know I've done a lot. I've done marketing design work. I've done product design work. I've had a little bit of chance to do, yeah, branding and and some other things. But I think I still see it as this you know ever unraveling like fascination. And so my my goal is really just to continue pursuing that, and see where it leads. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, maybe along those lines, I'm curious if you have a favorite piece of advice that you have received personally, or maybe one of your favorite pieces of advice to pass along to your team. Yeah, that's a great, great one. I think, I mean, it's not a piece of advice and it wasn't something that was ever said to me, but I think something that I, something that was magical at, at Apple, that was just innate in the, in the kind of design culture there that I've definitely carried forward. Um, and <laughs> I didn't necessarily appreciate it at the time, but as I've been able to work with more teams and more people, I've definitely seen that most people don't think about it this way. And, and it's that, you know, when you're, um, it's just the idea that, you know, when you're presenting work, when you're reviewing work, your job is really to ask great questions. And it's to ask great questions mm -hmm. if you're the yeah. person that designed it. And it's to ask incredible questions with really different angles, uh, you know, if you're the person that's reviewing it or the person that, you know, gets to weigh in on it. And I think generally... What, where that goes really bad, and there's a bunch of like reasons that totally make sense about why this happens, um, it is when you know you're in a review and it's just approached as a critique because a in most people that immediately gauges all your defensive <laughs> response yeah, and right. defensive mechanisms, you're not receptive to any of that. But I also think it's just inherently. Uh, it's inherently uh, worse on a bunch of levels. Like for me, the biggest unlocks I've ever had as someone doing the work who's super close to it and felt like I had a really good understanding and I've tried all these things and this is the best approach is just to have somebody ask me a really amazing question that leaves me thinking and leaves that rattling around in the back of my mind. Like, and you know, at Apple, those questions would range from like, well, uh, I don't, th sometimes they'd be, I don't know, something that's like the form factor of something. So instead of approaching it as a gallery, what if it was something that had tabs or what if it had this sort of an interaction model? And those are, you know, those are interesting questions. Those are pretty tactical. But I think the bigger ones are um, some, you know, and some of, and sometimes you can be in an environment where maybe those questions are a little bit too uh, esoteric, something like, how do you make it more magical? Or 
me. Like those are things I've actually heard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I struggle yeah, right. to try to resolve those <laughs> questions, but the ones that I de- that definitely resonate with me are like, is this the right mood? Like if you step back and you squint at it, does it have yeah. the right feel to it? And you know, if you're not a designer, I don't think you understand what that means. But if you are a designer, you totally get it. That things have a mood, things have a feel, things have an atmosphere to them. And um, yeah, so I would just say approach, uh, you know, and, and that's the same way I've approached working with great people is, you know, I've always found no matter how talented someone is, you're always going to get much, 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 you're always going to get the best work out of them if you just engage them. And because the best people I think naturally want to, they're always not satisfied with their work. They're always trying to find that last little bit they can do. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, asking questions, especially more open-ended questions, uh, it's a great approach. Yeah. As you were saying that, I was thinking of one of Tim Ferriss's questions that he likes to ask is what would this look like if it were easy? Yeah. You know, thinking about those kinds of questions and learning how to formulate those, I think is, is huge. But, um, as, as we wind down here, I'm, I'm curious if you have any challenges or asks or requests for our listeners. Um, I mean, I have to throw it out. If you're interested in, you know, project management, task management, you're dissatisfied with other tools, definitely go and check out flow at at giftflow.com. Um, and I think you'll be excited about what we're doing and how we're doing it differently, um, in this space. I think, um, yeah, don't, I mean, there's no real, there's no asks, um, I mean, the only thing that I would throw out as a general challenge, because I found uh, this just, you know, to designers kind of everywhere, because <laughs> I find I found that, um, you know, and I think really what we're doing at Flow is a great example where the, I think where designers need to engage more and where they need to be able to have a bigger impact is tools that they may not initially be attracted to, but tools that people spend a ton of time on. People, mm, right. you know, invest in heavily. They look, they use, and they, you know, require for something that they do. And some examples of these, you know, that are, I don't know, depending on your perspective, these could be fine design tools or they could be poorly designed tools. But something like, you know, and that's what was fascinating about Square is everything in that space, all other payment terminals, the dashboard to check your sales, the email you would get with a receipt if you were a customer, mm-hmm. the you know email we would send a business at the end of the year to recap everything that they did as a business. That was such an amazing encapsulation of how you can take something that is dull and lifeless in a space and be able to just make it something where you're all, you know, you're just trying to make it this special thing. And so I would just say that, you know, um, if you're interested in it, if you're inclined to it, uh, lean into that space and try to find teams that, again, have all the right things going for them, but they need somebody to come in and design this thing with love and heart and create something that can actually connect with people. And I think that there's not generally not enough of that going on. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think that's a great challenge. And if we have any listeners out there who feel like they have done that or found that successfully, or maybe know of a company who's done that well, reach out and we're always looking for other great interviews for the show. So, Hey, before we let you go, Daniel, um, let us know, let our listeners know where they can track you down on the interwebs and maybe connect more with uh, flow. Yeah. Sounds great. So everyone can visit flow at giftflow.com. Uh, it's the best way to find us. Um, and then personally, you know, I'm, uh, not necessarily all over the place. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter, but um, you know, you can definitely go to danielscrivener.com, uh, Daniel, and then Scrivener, S-C-R-I-V-N-E-R.com. And uh, that'll link off to um, all my work, all the different things that I do. Um, that's the best place to find me. And if anyone, you know, if uh, I, I would just throw it out there. If anyone listening to this has grappled with their own, you know, um, I don't how do I progress from doing this to this? Or how do I make the move from being a designer to eventually going on and leading a team? Or, you know, I'm a junior designer and what does it look like or feel like to become an art director, a creative director? Like, mm-hmm. please feel free to reach out and, and ask those questions. Um, Cause I always love hearing from people and I, I love trying to help if I can. <laughs> awesome. Well, we will definitely link to all those places in the show notes. So everybody can track you down and find all that stuff. It was, it was a pleasure chatting with you today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on the show and thank you for being obsessed with design. (laughs) Very obsessed. (laughs) (laughs) 
Okay, kids, that's episode number 142 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. There's an imminent storm. It's on the